We are creating a company that feels right for the time. We don't think about diversity, equity, inclusivity as a goal. It's actually who we are. This is a place you want to be part of. It's a place that you feel valued and listened to, where you can sort of be yourself. Well, we're back uh, day two at Health 2022 in Las Vegas. We had a busy podcast day yesterday, an even busier one today. So, hi, everybody. I'm Adam Silverman. I'm the host of uh, Syllable's new podcast, Solve. And I'm joined today by the CEO of 1UP Health, Joe Gagnon. Joe, welcome to the show. Adam, thanks for having me. It's always fun to do this right from a show floor. Yeah, right, exactly. It's uh, It's been a bit of a challenge for Chris, who has tried to figure out how do we get the sound just right, but it seems to be working just fine. All right, it's better than sort of being on a subway, so, you know. Well, well maybe actually we should try that. You yeah. know, maybe we'll, we'll end up in the Bronx one day and do it from the subway, just like exactly. some of the, you know, some of those uh, world-class violin players, right? right? Okay. So tell me a little bit about 1UP Health and, and your story. How did you, how'd you get started with it, and, mm. and what's the problem you're really trying to solve? Thanks. Yeah, so, you know, I always say that I'm really not a healthcare guy, but, you know, my early career, I worked at Presbyterian Medical Center in New York City. It's actually where I met my wife, who is the director of medical records, and we built a chart tracking system. And sometimes it feels like all these years later, <laughs> we haven't really advanced too far beyond that. And so I then spent a lot of my career focused on building systems that affect the consumer and how they live and operate. And so I figured as opportunities kept presenting themselves, and a bunch of my investor friends asked me to get involved in 1UP Health almost three years ago, to take a really good idea, which is to provide for initially patient access to medical record data, you know, across an app or through an API. But to do that more broadly, I came in to help operate the company and build really ultimately what's going to be the data infrastructure for the industry using this data standard called FHIR, F-H-I-R, which then actually stops us arguing about what the format of the data is in and allows us to access it, connect, compute, and then sort of change the essence of how healthcare operates going forward. So for people that um, may not be as well read into the data problems within healthcare, mm. why is this an important problem to solve? Yeah, that's a great question, Adam. So everyone on this floor would say, oh yeah, we tried interoperability for many, many years. And I think, you know, we've all gotten used to end-to-end -end data management in our lives, you know? So I place an order on Amazon, next thing I get is a text from UPS that's gonna be on my front stoop tomorrow, you know, whatever it is, all that's data integration. And in healthcare, that doesn't happen. We're all still filling out forms, we're faxing papers in, we're re-entering data. The data has no currency, it's usually 90 days old. Mm -hmm. We're making both medical decisions and cost decisions on data that we can't even compute. And so people are doing a lot of manipulation to try and get the data to make some of the most important decisions we could ever make about our health care. And so what we know, and the industry has finally gotten to this point, which is if we could agree on a standard, just like we did with networking or web standards years ago, if we could agree on a standard, we could then have all of the parties operate on behalf of that consumer here, which is called a patient, to their best advantage. So that could be around care, it could be around risk, it could be around quality or cost but you have to have a same data standard to make that happen. Otherwise, it slows down and they keep asking you to fill out another piece of paper. So as I walk around the floor here at Health and you see all the plethora of digital health companies, almost everybody will say something similar. They'll mm. say, if I can just get right. so-and-so to do something slightly different, or if I can get so-and-so to agree that this is the way we're gonna solve the problem, right. or let's just agree that this is the best workflow for this particular problem, why is FHIR the right solution for this problem? Yeah, so a couple of reasons. One, I think FHIR leveraged just common web standards, this thing called JSON, JavaScript object notation. It doesn't really matter, but it's a web standard that's been used for all the web apps that we use. So we didn't have to be smarter than the industry. We finally just adopted what we all use individually on our smartphones today. So that's sort of, I think, part one. Part two is that, you know, the guys at HL7, this is an evolution of it, right. finally got it to be contemporary. I mean, what, HL7 version 2 was done before Google search even existed. Right. So building it today makes it more relevant. And then, you know, really at the end of the day, CMS, you know, Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services, which is the largest payer in the country and largest payer in the world, said, oh, by the way, let's get over ourselves and just use this as the common data standard. So a combination of factors that came together 
that said this is the time and it's going to work this time. What's the what's the the common application of your solution? How is that, you know, for if if I'm a patient, how am I going to experience yeah. or know that One Up Health is somehow involved in my care? A lot of times you won't even know we're there, right? Because we're infrastructure today on the way to more compute, which would be the analytics that comes to use. But one way would be if you wanted to get your claims records from Cigna or Aetna, you might make a request from an app and our API would go get that data for you, that claims data. Or you might use 23andMe to get your medical record from an EHR system and they would use our API to do that. And then we're building on behalf of health plans more of the infrastructure for that data to be resident so that in whatever form you want, build this more historical longitudinal view, more complete, more deep, and more current, then anytime that data access would happen, the one of health capability could be embedded in that. So if I understand correctly, you're essentially building the infrastructure to move the data around. Is there interest in then um, hosting that data or accessing that data and then being um, being able to provide analytics for yes. customers? So we say we do both compute and connect. Okay. And so the connect part is the first sort of use case, and we all know that. But really, at the end of the day, where the real value is going to come is out of the analytics, maybe one day AI, it could be digital quality, it could be how price transparency and prior auth happen. All of those are going to compute against a common data set. And so for us, building out that foundation platform, it's just like any database the real purpose of it is not to store the data, but to use the data. And today we're computing against data that might not have the currency or the completeness, and you can use tools against ours. We built this in an open way. So we wouldn't even have a problem. You want to use Tableau against this data, that's fine. You know, whatever your favorite analytics tool is, or you could use our capability. And more and more, an open architecture to that data will help the industry. As the leader of this company, what are your biggest challenges? I think that, you know, it's always interesting as you start to grow a company, like you can yeah. get a little bit excited about what you have going on. I think especially given today's market, it's growing at a reasonable rate that allows you to continue to build and grow, but without taking on too much risk. Because really at the end of the day, we need to be here five or 10 years from now. And so for me, it's really important to sort of always stay a little bit behind the demand curve, yeah. you know, to not overhire, to not overspend. and to create real value, and so you have durability. So, you know, like in some ways people laugh at it. I always say, like, we're trying to build a boring company, yeah, right? You know, yeah. like just, I don't know, it's like Boeing. You like when the plane takes off and lands, it's pretty boring. You don't want anything else. The same with us. We just want you to get your data in, data out. It's just going to work. It's going to scale. And so for me, sometimes it's just the exuberance is always a bit of a risk. Managing your excitement for all the great things that we can end game here, which is better healthcare for everyone, and say, let's first build the foundation and then move to the next level. How has, um, how has sort of the, the talent acquisition piece and hiring mm -hmm. gone in the last, you know, six to 12 months as we came out of COVID and, you know, it really looked like um, these human resources were really getting increasingly expensive and rarer and rarer? Yeah, it's a great question because it's actually changed yet again. One of the things you get that so the privilege of as a CEO, right? You work on a lot of stuff, but one of them is how do you build the company culture that you think is relevant to today's sort of people market. I have right. a customer market, I have a people market, I have an investor market. And so we are creating a company that feels right for the time. So we don't think about DEI, this diversity, equity, inclusivity as a goal. It's actually who we are. This is a place you want to be part of. It's a place that you feel valued and listened to where you can sort of be yourself. And it's not just one dimensional and doesn't look the same to everyone. And so it's helped us in recruiting. We've been able to recruit some great people who have lots of choices, right. but want to be part of not just a great technical challenge, but a company that feels good to them. You know, so we have fantastic maternity benefits or fertility benefits, or we have good, you know, paternity benefits as well. And we say like, listen, the whole person matters to us. And so that's been really great. We have great work, people love the mission, you know, that's easy, right? Longer, happier, better lives, better equity, lower right. cost, lower risk. So that's good for us. But then, you know, now what's interesting is as people are laying off, you know, who yeah. overhired, 
there are amazing, talented people who we'll probably get access to that we wouldn't have before right. because they like this problem, the scale of our problem, and the way that we're building this company. So, you know, I like to think of it, it's what I was told the first time I got in a startup, it's a place you can put your fingerprints on. And I want that to happen. I literally want everyone to feel like this is their company. And it's not just, I got a role to play, yeah. but everyone else does as well. Yeah, you're, you're a leader and a custodian, but there are other people that, you know, that are part of the company. And Yeah, you know, the people have written about the servant leader model, and yeah. I think a lot of people use that language, but don't live it. And so, you know, I think Simon Sinek best, which is leaders eat last, is a really way, way to think about it. Yeah. And, you know, it's a good test of yourself, right? Like, what is your role? How do you facilitate? Because if you can get greatness out of people, Man, my job is way easier right. than if I try to legislate. Right. What's going on from a real estate standpoint and getting back to the office versus hybrid work? That's a great question also, because I really feel bad for people who are being told what to do and how to live. We have an office in Boston. It's a great place. We have this old brick and bead building. Mm -hmm. We have nice workspace. You know, it's probably crowded on Wednesdays. You know, half of our employees are in an hour of Boston. The other half, they may never see Boston in their whole life. Right. We aren't here to tell you, like, we want you to do your work. We want you to work the way you want. If you need to collaborate, by all means, come to the office. We have quarterly meetings with each of our departments so that you can get together in person. The Zoom life doesn't solve for every problem. But if that's the life you need because that's the way you want to live, then we want to support you. I'm not here to legislate how people live. We want to get the work done. We want to make this fun and exciting. You know, like, there are companies I just don't, I wonder how out of touch the leadership is when they start to say, hey, look, if you don't show up tomorrow, you're going to be fired. Right. Like, really? That's how we want to treat people? I just, I don't know. I think we all should listen. We are here to measure our results, but it doesn't have to happen sitting at a desk like it's 1974. Yeah, I think for, for leaders like yourself in our own experience at Syllable, um, this, life is a pendulum, yes. you know? So the the the... We had this unnatural experiment of the pandemic that pushed the pendulum way to one side. And people, certain people like the, the you know, remote lifestyle. Yeah. But I think there are other people that crave connection and they want to come in. And so I think the pendulum is starting to swing back. I don't think it'll ever go to a fully, you know, on-prem kind of workforce. But to your point, if people are happier and more productive doing that and they can live better lives, then they end up actually becoming, you know, better owners of companies like ours, too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the labor market opened for us yeah. like it never has. I mean, you know, I could have someone in Idaho, California, right. North Carolina and Boston. What, what I was going to do before is tell them to all move. It, unrealistic. So I do think that thinking about, you know, how do you get the most out of people is important. Listening all the time. You know, we use... Culture Amp to do employee sentiment surveys, make sure we're always have our pulse, whatever comes up as a hot issue we start working on. And, you know, I think that to your point, I don't know if we know exactly what the balance is, right. but it'll sort of show itself. Exactly. Do the current uh, macroeconomic factors keep you up at night? <sighs> I think, well, healthcare, not really. You know, we spend what, 3.8 trillion or $4 trillion on healthcare. Right. It needs to improve. Uh, customer satisfaction is low. Outcomes aren't where they should be. So I do think while there's probably some macroeconomic effects, I don't think it's going to affect our growth because we're really trying to help actually reduce cost, which everyone's sort of interested in, improve the customer experience or the member experience, and ultimately let the industry operate better. So we might probably just see a little bit of pullback you know, some investors might be looking at it differently, but I actually, you know, I'm glad I'm not in some other industries right now. I don't think we're going to have a big struggle in health. What are your biggest challenges as the CEO of this growing company? Having the right senior leadership team, the right people at the table with me. You know, uh, what I've known in my career is that when you have the best people around you, the best outcomes happen. And, and best is, of course, relative. You know, it's like, do they want to put the effort in? Do they have the right background and skills? But, but building out that leadership team, because it's not about Joe only, right? This is about having people who can own and deliver who are excited about what we have going on and making sure that I make this a place that they want to be part of and just continuing to build that. Because at each stage of growth in a company like ours, new skills are required. Sometimes people scale with the business, sometimes they don't. Nothing bad about that. Just let's all understand what you need to get to your next level of growth. 
if you run into somebody that sort of, you know, is a, is a fanboy or a fangirl of Joe Gagnon and, you know, they say, how do I get to be like you? And how do I run a, you know, a small tech startup or a growing tech startup? And how do I be successful? And what kind of advice do you have for, for somebody that wants to follow in your footsteps? <laughs> Thanks, Adam. I appreciate that. You know, uh, if I thought back on my life, right, and that said, when you graduated from college, if that's what you did, what would you have ever imagined would happen? I would say that if you wrote it all down, I would probably tell you none of it could have happened. Right. Like I didn't see, oh, I'd be a CEO five times or, you know, I would run a marathon on six continents in six days or whatever it is that I ended up doing in my life. I think one, who you hang out with really matters. If you hang out with the right people, your life is going to get better. Number two, put everything you have into it. Don't do anything sort of halfway. Like if you're going to go, go all in, you know, be sincere about it. Number three. When you make a commitment to someone, make sure you made it to yourself, because then you'll actually deliver on your commitments. I think often we say we're going to do something, but we haven't really made that agreement with ourselves. I think number four, enjoy your journey. There's ups and downs, but like, this is it, man. This is what you got. This is your life. Have some fun. You know, don't take yourself too seriously. Right. Understand that we're all not going to be perfect. Uh, and then the last thing is, I think, give back. Every time you give back, you get it again. You know, I think at this point in my life, it's about enabling everyone else to sort of achieve what their potential is. But I would say that inside you, in everyone who's listening to this, I can promise you, you haven't achieved your potential because I don't think we ever do in our lifetime. There is so much innate capability. It's a matter of whether you're going to tap into it and realize that you got your lottery ticket the day you were born and just cash it in every day by how you show up for life and magic will happen. Where does this passion come from? I mean, you, you, I didn't provide you that question. You didn't think about that answer for a long period of time, but it rolls off your tongue. And it's, it's, a, it's a really amazing philosophy of how to live one's life. So where does that, is that from the Bronx? Is that, is yeah, that from your Yeah, I think it's growth? learned. I think it's learned, you know, uh, I didn't have the easiest start. You know, we were low or middle income, but I had a beautiful family. My parents were amazing, just, loving, supportive, you know, didn't matter. Uh, I just, you know, I didn't sort of like the feeling of being average and I just didn't think that anyone's privilege should be the end of the story for me. And so, um, so it evolved, you know, like it is easy in a sense to say it, Adam, all these years later, I was figuring it out as I went along. But what I found is this, every time I put myself into it, I got a return. Just as a quick, quick story, you know, like I was at Ernst & Young years ago, and a partner said, hey, who wants to go work on a project in Rochester, New York in the winter? And no one volunteered <laughs> but me. And I'm like, I'll go. And he says, you know what the project is? I'm like, I have no idea, but I'll just go do it. Right. And do you know what happened after that? He kept asking me to do stuff. Because I put myself out there. You said there. yes. That's right. it. And so it just kept being self-reinforcing. And so now I'm here at this point, and I'm like, yeah, it is easy because it was a story I wrote. And I don't think, I think so often we get in our own way. You know, I've been blogging for 10 years. I have a podcast like you. Like, who would I, I don't even right. care if anyone listens. Right. It doesn't even matter. It's like, I'm creating. I think another piece of advice to people is try be consuming less and creating more. Give back to the world. Like, these are all just really simple. I always think that the currency of life is in the dictionary. Passion, optimism, grit, determination, opportunity. Like, use those words. Don't use the other ones, like, I can't, or I won't, or I don't. Like, stay away from the negative talk. Maybe a little bit of time will resolve all for you, but I promise you that my journey is not actually that unique. It's just the choices that I made, and it's been pretty fun, I gotta tell you. So with your unique perspective, I wanna ask you this question. So I spent 30 years on the provider side before I came to join mm -hmm. Syllables in, as, a, as a medical technology startup. And I have to tell you, um, healthcare created or, or fed my cynical soul. Yeah. You know, you, you see time and again, day in and day out, how it misses the mark to deliver value for what we're spending on it mm -hmm. for the $4 trillion. And um, when I first started this podcast, the question I was asking everybody is, is healthcare broken? Right. Um, so let me ask you, I'm curious with your, with your perspective, with mm. that philosophy you just shared, is healthcare broken? I think we're on the way to fixing it. I really do. I think there's a couple of factors that are number one, actually sort of something not, neither of us control, which is that every year new people are born and they continue to move forward with a different baseline than any of us had. 
So that will change the industry in the next 25 years, whether we want to or not, because it'll be a whole different set of people. It gives me optimism, because I think they actually care about the planet, they care about people more than sort of the historical depression era kids who run business today. The second thing is I think that the technology is finally caught up into this industry. There's actually a lot of good intention, but the scale of it sometimes gets in the way. The profit motive gets in the way, but we're starting to see real progress. And I think that, you know, we can't give up, right? Like, even though it feels broken, yep. we all know that we have hope because that's what keeps humanity going. And so, yeah, sometimes, you know, like I like trail running and I trip and fall and you skin your knee. That's not the last time you go do it because it's hard. It's hard means we should go do it. I actually think humans don't like easy. I think it makes us unproductive. When it's hard, it's a good problem to work on. This is a really good problem to work on, which is why we're doing this, which is why I'm so inspired to work on it. And yeah, that's okay. You know, uh, when you run a hundred mile race, which I've done many times, what you learn is the following, that discomfort isn't a reason to quit, right? It never rises to the level of quit. I'm never gonna quit because I'm discomfort. And that's what we find ourselves in, that's okay. Right. That's what hard things really get us to do really good things at the end of the day. And if there's something that's worth being self-serving about, we either all are or will be patients. And so that's right. contributing to the solution is something that, you know, it's almost a responsibility for all of us. I agree. I agree. And it, look, if we can pull together people like you are sponsoring good ideas and bringing them to the market, to others, we'll start to hear them more yep. than the alternative. Yep. And I think that the, the noise will be on the positive side. Joe, I've really enjoyed this. Thank you for taking time today and coming and talk with, uh, talking with us. Joe Gagnon, CEO of 1UP Health. Adam, thanks so much. Look forward to doing this again sometime. Likewise. Thanks, man. That was great. Thank you. Amazing.